So good evening and welcome. My name is Joanna Martinez and I'm the third vice president and chair of the education committee for NAACP Lancaster. The NAACP's mission is to secure political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights in order to eliminate race-based discrimination and ensure the health and well-being of all persons. This evening's program is an open forum, both with running candidates and seated candidates for school board for the school district of Lancaster in the upcoming municipal elections on Tuesday, November 2nd. This is a Q&A session. This is a time for you to get to know each candidate a little bit better and to ask questions about issues that are important to you. You may post any questions you may have for the panelists in the chat box. And uh, my co-host and I will get to as many of them as we can within our allotted time. Um, so my co-moderator for this evening is Mr. Larock Hudson. Larock is the chair of NAACP Lancaster's Political Action Committee. He's also a well-known community activist here in Lancaster. Larock, I know that we're gonna have some wonderful discussion here tonight. So I'm going to hand this over to you and, and have you introduce our panelists. Well, good evening, first of all, to everybody out in the stratosphere. Um, and then to the candidates and of course my wonderful co-moderator. Um, I'll start with the incumbents this evening. Um, we have Mara Cresswell McGran and Luis Morales. And um, our two new candidates would be Molly Henderson and Jen Eaton. Um, this evening, um, we're just going to do a question and answer session, um, try to keep it pretty comfortable for everyone. Uh, these particular candidates this um, election season don't have contenders. Um, so this is an opportunity for the general public residents and uh, students of SDOL to get to know the candidates, um, get to know the incumbents and um, where they stand on the issues that face the students and um, the school district in general. Um, Joanna, did you have any particular uh, format, any way you want to start or incumbents, newbies, no? No, I think, I think what we can do is um, we can just ask, you know, some, some starter questions and you guys can take turns as it kind of flows naturally for you. Um, just keeping in mind that we have, you know, multiple people that, that want to get out what, what their, you know, their opinion or their ideas also. Um, but I guess, uh, did you have a question you wanted to start with, Larock? or? Um, no, I was just going to go ahead and start with some, sh some brief intros, let everybody, um, get introduced. Okay. And, um, once we finish up, we can go ahead and take it from there. If, um, we'll start with the incumbents, I'll start with Mara and, um, she can just popcorn it. Well, I guess she can't popcorn it because there's only two incumbents. So um, she <laughs> wants to kick it to Luis and then he can just pick somebody from there. Great, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's really an honor to be here and I'm uh, really glad that we uh, get this chance to have this conversation. Uh, my name is Mara cresswell McGran. I uh, have been on the SUL school board for four years. Um, I'm running for a second term. Um, I first and foremost am a parent in the district. I think that's, uh, you know, people often ask, uh, how did you, how did you come to this job? And I think it was a, a progression from being a parent in this district. I have a, a daughter who is a junior at Pitt. I have a son who is a sophomore at Temple and I have a junior at McCaskey High School and they all attended um, SUL schools from kindergarten um, until they graduated and will graduate. So uh, my husband and I have been big, big uh, supporters of the district. Um, we live here, we own a small business in Lancaster City. Um, and I really enjoyed my time on school board. I would say that the, the past four years, when, if someone had uh, told me what these four years would entail four years ago, I, I don't know, maybe I would have hesitated, um, but nobody, nobody anticipated a pandemic. So we've had to make some really, really hard, hard decisions that um, people have not always been happy with, but we're really fortunate here in SDUL to have a board that um, philosophically, I, I think it's fair to say we all agree on a lot of things and um, 
we really move forward um, together very, very well. So uh, it's a great district. It's the biggest district in the in the uh, county. I think some a fun fact is that our budget is much, much bigger than Lancaster City's. And we are one of the biggest employers in the entire county. And I, I think sometimes people don't don't remember that. You know, I think last count we were between 1,500 and 1,600 employers, employees. I'm sorry. So um, all these different parts uh, make it a, a really big, complicated, messy, um, sometimes fun, and really um, really fulfilling job. So if Lewis isn't ready, uh, maybe we hop to Jen. I'm ready. <laughs> Sorry, Lewis. <laughs> I know you can't tell right now. Um, so my name is Lewis Morales. Um, I am also on incumbent on the board. Um, I've been on since uh, June of 2020. Um, and um, I got on because I replaced um, Harvey Miller and I'm running now for my full first complete term. Uh, so I'm running for re-election for that. Um, I'm also a parent in the district. I have um, a third grader, a first grader, and a K-4 um, kid in the district. Um, and my daughter is also doing the junior cheerleading through the rec center. Um, and I, I got into it because all through, all through school and I've been into uh, public service. Um, I went to the public service Le and leadership SLC at McCaskey. Um, I've been a, I'm a product of the district. Um, and I've just helping people is what I do. Um, I'm also a graduate from Millersville for a degree in social work. Um, and I work in the community for uh, justice works. Um, so it's an agency that uh, services uh, families who are in with children and youth um, and trying to complete those goals. Um, kind of the short intro that I got for myself right now. Um, so I'll just kick it over to Jen. Thank you very much. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that there is another incumbent who unfortunately can't be here. He had to step away um, because he was pulled to a, a school board matter um, and he worked it out with Mara and Luis so that Luis so they would be able to manage all things. So he wished he could be here. Um, so uh, my name is Jen Eaton. Um, I'm a lifelong Lancaster resident. I currently live in Lancaster Township with my uh, husband and two of our three children. Um, I attended SDOL schools the whole way through um, graduation and went to Franklin and Marshall College. My oldest attended McCaskey and graduated in 2014. And um, our two youngest currently attend fifth and sixth grades um, at ER Martin School. Um, in addition to volunteering in leadership positions um, at my children's schools, and in the district parent advisory committee over the last 16 years. Um, I've spent a lot of time also volunteering um, in my former church. I'm a board member um, Meals on Wheels of Lancaster and um, also on the executive team of the NAACP branch um, 2302. Um, this, the pandemic really highlighted to me um, some great needs in terms of being able to um, connect and bridge communication with families and help them to be better advocates for their students. Um, I also found that a lot of my professional experiences and skills um, leading up to this point um, really helped me to understand the process. So when I was talking with other um, families about what was happening. Um, I had a, an understanding about how the process worked and why things worked that they well, worked the way that they did and helped to break things down for them as much as I could. Um, and years that I spent working in a local nonprofit um, around school and community partnerships and um, creating greater family engagement um, gave me a lot of insights also into some of the ways that families are sometimes left out of the process or don't feel they have a voice. So um, I think the long and short of it is this is a real opportunity to help step up and model what um, parent engagement can look like. Um, and how to um, be an adv advocate for our children and, and use our, our voices um, to um, 
really be a sounding board for all of the 11,000 students in our district. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here and uh, turn it over to you, Molly. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for having us and thank the uh, NAACP for sponsoring this and, and having interest in the community uh, for the children. As I was saying earlier to Joanna and Laroc that I was, for years, I had always wanted to go on the school board. Uh, my background is education. I'm a teacher, have taught on many levels. Um, I have a doctor in education and I wasn't able to run because of a conflict of interest with my husband's work. And that is now going away. So now I can step forward to, to do this. Um, and also why I'm doing this now is because the conflict is gone, but my background is really in public health. And uh, some people may remember that I was head of public health in the city. Um, and most people know me from the restaurant inspections <laughs> and call me and ask me where they should eat. But um, that's not this point. The point is the pandemic is there. And the other thing that I have not really discussed is my background in lead paint abatement. Um, I am a uh, certified lead paint abater, <laughs> if there is such a word. And uh, that is continues to be a problem. Uh, particularly for school children and children in um, the school district because the houses are so old and there has not been the remediation and the um, enforcement of regulations hasn't been as strong as it should be. So I, I think that is something the, uh, for the children. Um, I also had two children that attended school district of Lancaster, as I was talking about the uh, letter jacket. And uh, that was good. My, um, my son went all the way through McCaskey and graduated. My daughter went to elementary school at Martin and then tra transferred to Janus uh, for some special uh, attention. So, I think I have some background that will be helpful during COVID with the public health and my background in teaching and educational policy. And I look forward to um, working with everyone. It's, it's very interesting, these, these forums, and I get to listen to everyone talk. And it's, uh, it's a good crew. I'm, I'm impressed. So I, I look forward to working with them. Thank you. So I heard some interesting things um, and I appreciate all of you for stepping forward and um, having the confidence to run. Um, but I'm one that kind of likes to shake things up. Um, and so um, though you don't have any competition on the ballot, I would like to hear from each of the candidates, what, what sets you apart from um, the person next to you on the ballot? What um, would make you the better candidate? I see everybody's wheels turning, so I'm not going to call on anybody. As soon as you feel like so, you, you got it, go ahead and throw Daddy, it out. I, Daddy, I don't know that I understand the question. I, I don't understand the question. Well, well, at the end of the day, politics is a sport. And even though you all are vying to be on the same team, one day you will be vying again. You will be uh, measured against someone. Um, I would hope in order to keep uh, perspectives and um, a certain amount of equity in the community. Um, we can't have everybody on a body all thinking the same way and moving in the same direction that, um, you know, tends to breed inequities. And so, um, again, you don't have any competition against you on the ballot right now, 
but you all um, felt as though you brought something special to the table um, that could add to uh, what the school board already has going for it. So what makes you that candidate to be able to um, move the school board's goals and values in the direction um, that you see the, sc the school district could be in? Well, I, I, I think we all bring, um, that, that is why I think this group is so interesting is that we all bring different pieces to the puzzle and um, watching this group work together. Yes, there's differences, but that, that's part of the, we are trying to promote uh, diversity and different voices coming forward. And I think that group, this particular group uh, does that very well. And you know, if we want to give different labels to each one of us, you know, this person, when you have a collection of a group, everybody has different roles. And I see different roles being done by each of us. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, I, <laughs> I just- Cor uh, Correct, but at the end of the day, you entered a race correct um and that race was to be the best candidate not to uh not to um run as a team um you decided on your own personally to jump into this race to be a candidate for school board. what happened after the candidacy any alliances you may have made any anything to further that goal while in the race um is kind of null and void when it comes to this question because again you personally got into the race for a reason so there was things that you there were benefits that you believe you could bring to the school board that made you the candidate to be so to say and so with that being said you had confidence in yourself so what were those things that gave you the confidence to run so, so, I'll so, I'll, people stay, so. Yeah, so, so I'll say that um, I'm, I'm a parent um, of special needs children. So um, I bring that to the table, um, having a son with autism um, and, you know, being well-versed in, in that world with IEPs and all that. So I bring that perspective to the board. Um, you know, also, you know, being a parent of elementary school age children also brings a different perspective. Um, you know, there is, besides myself, but one of the other board members has, I think two of the other ones have elementary, but more middle school um, age children. So I think it's just me and another one that just had elementary school age um, children. So we kind of bring that, that in there too. And, um, you know, that's another perspective, which, you know, it's useful to have on the board when decisions are being made to keep that, that part there, because, you know, a lot of the decisions we make, we don't always think about, oh, how will this affect families with children with special needs? You know, we're just thinking of just, you know, able-bodied, like all oh, the children are all the same, you know, and some kids, you know, need more help than others um so you know i want to bring those resources to those kids to make sure that they have the same um chance and the same education as those peers of theirs who are able-bodied and, and quote unquote normal not, you know, not that normal is is different for everybody so Okay. Um, you know, I really appreciate the question because I mean, it does highlight that we need a variety of people on our board to um, do the work. But I would, I, I would push back a little because this um, the thing that I really learned when I got on school board was that, and I've said this before in other forums, you know, you can come in and have your issue. And I sometimes I use the example of like school lunch. Um, you know, I'm going to change all the school lunch 
the whole program, I'm doing this, this is my, this is my issue. And you're not going to do anything unless you can get four other people to agree with you on that. I mean, at the end of the day, five people out of nine people have to agree to move something forward. So I would actually argue that, yes, it's great. Everybody brings a piece of the puzzle, but you also really, really have to learn how to work with groups. And that was the argument I made to the, the five of us, actually, that, you know, Dave Perry is the other person who's not here. Um, you know, because I, I didn't know Jen, I knew Molly a little bit, and obviously Dave and Lewis and I knew each other, but that was kind of the argument that we said, hey, we should all work together, because I learned that four years ago. I worked with uh, Selena and Dave and, on an election, and honestly, we came in and hit the ground running because we knew each other and we had worked together on something like a campaign, and it was it, it was really, really good, and I feel that way, too. I think that we've done some some good work together, despite, you know, right now we don't have any competition, but, um, you know, I know Molly and Jen have been paying attention and watching school board meetings, which is kind of the biggest thing to get yourself started, um, and they're, you know, they're learning the issues and they're, they're ready, um, and I think they'll both bring different things. Um, to the board and I've so enjoyed working with Lewis. I mean, I know we were talking about it the other day. He's been here for a year. I feel like he's been been around forever. But yeah, we don't always agree on everything. That is for certain, but but what a good good bunch. Thank you for that, Mara. Jen, did you want to add something? I do. Um, I mean, I think I spoke to your to your question, Larock, um, uh, at the beginning of my my opening. Um, I spoke a little bit to some of my professional experiences, um, which I think are what set me apart. Um, my personal and professional volunteer work um, have enabled me to, even while I'm currently not working, stay actively engaged and I'm um, talking with people about what's important to them and also translate that um, to um, people who are in positions that, that can hear that and maybe make change. And so while I, I actually joke that I would never be a candidate and I had worked in campaigns before, um, I saw where the legislative advocacy that I had done and the systems work and, uh, and in particular the work that I did with the school district and the school and community network to advocate for community schools is something that I don't think anybody else can say they have. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback a little bit um, on what others have said and I didn't enter this race despite anybody. And I mean, to spite, despite, I entered it because I saw people who were working really, really hard, making really difficult decisions at a time. And to me, this pandemic has been all hands on deck. You know, um, it looks different ways for different people. And for me, it was like, what is it to have these these connections and these skill sets and these, um, um, you know, real blessings without using them? And so. It, if anything, I think having been out of work for, for just a little bit of time recently while I've been raising my own kids, if anything, it's made all of that work and all of the things that I did to ground myself and um, just absolutely relevant. All of a sudden it was like, okay, this really, this makes sense. And so um, working with the, uh, the others through the campaign and watching them on the Zooms helps me to see um, some of the, the dynamics. I'm a, I feel like I'm very comfortable with the issues that they're working on right now. Um, and I'm really glad that we're not dealing with ideological blunt guns blazing. You know, we're, I feel very fortunate that however um, human, <laughs> We have nine people who are working really hard all for the benefit of our students and not necessarily for their own political gain. So that's that's my short answer. Well, I thank you. Uh, I thank you all for those those answers. I, I was thinking about what would I bring to the table and all I could think of was, well, I bake. So you would all get cookies every meeting. I think it's probably- We could totally the do the baker. <laughs> Her snickerdoodles are to die for. <laughs> but I do, I really appreciate that. And I think, you know, the, the different things that you bring together. And again, I know, it, you know, it's a competition, but it's not. And it shouldn't be once you're there. 
Um, but those things that, that do set you apart, those gifts and those talents that you have, I, those are probably also connected to things that you're passionate about. And we have a, uh, a question from an audience member from Belisa uh, Kennard, and she says, good evening, everyone. I would like to know what one thing in the SDUL uh, candidates, what one thing that you're passionate to see addressed through the board. So what is something that I know, Mary, you were like, school lunch, but, you know, we can see, you know, what, what, what kind of things I would, uh, what kind of things are you guys passionate about? And do you hope that you can make some change on the board? Um, I would, I would like to say about one thing that I have not brought up or it hasn't been brought up. Um, I am running for a two year term. Everyone else is running for a four year term. Um, unfortunately, Randy Carney passed away. And so I am running to fill his term. So, so there is a little difference here. There are four years and I'm a two year. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. So thank you. For that. And, and while I'm just blathering on here, uh, I guess my issue will be the big issue will be um, funding equity is uh, the there is. It is. So unfair and uh, glaring what the imbalance is, and uh, I, I would like for the board. Um, with its political base and its political voice address that. So. Thank you. I would say for myself, I know it's one thing that we've been working on on the board currently, but is to increase our um, social and emotional um, learning um, and how, you know, affects those students. I know it's something that it's we're working on now, but we're trying to, you know, it obviously needs to continue, that work needs to continue. Um, Cause you know, what happens at home affects school and what happens at school affects home. Um, and so, you know, any way that we can help address those, you know, concerns um, on either end will hopefully um, improve the student outcome um, at home. and in school. Thank you, Lewis. Um, Mara or, or Jen, any particular issue for you? No. Okay. Um, I will, I'll go whatever you want. Jen, you go. Okay. Um, so my fifth grader would probably like me to say changing the dress code policy for all of the students. <laughs> Um, uh, I would say, I know a lot of people have seen me in the community doing advocacy work and I apologize, I'm getting text messages and I don't know if that's making a sound for you guys too. Um, talked about equity and funding uh, in the school district of Lancaster and that's something that I'm incredibly um, proud of. And mobilization in our community has been huge. Uh, I think one of the things Know that is the most important for me is looking at the entire district through an equity lens. I know it's something that our district um, and, and Dr. Rao in particular talks a lot about. Um, there has been a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, plan developed, an extensive one. Um, it's something that filters through um, in curriculum. It filters through in you know how teachers. Um, you know, how are we staffing, things like that. I, and, and there's still a lot that I haven't learned. So I'm gonna say that too, before I go out on the limb, um, because there's a lot to learn. And that's, that's also a big piece to, to listen and learn and to see what's happening. But one thing that I'm really, really excited about um, is something that I've been talking about for probably about 10 years um, when I was on an exploratory committee for Reynolds Community School. And that was, is the boundary study. Um, at, back in uh, 2009, we were talking about the fact that Reynolds kids walk from as far as the train station um, to the north and then also down to Beaver Street, Andrew Street, even further to Reynolds, where I you know, was working at the time and where I also had been a student. And the idea for me that, that kids were expected to come emotionally ready to and, and, and perhaps, you know, whatever conditions that they've come from, um, 
expected to, to walk all of these dis distances and learn under the same circumstances. And in many instances, some of those schools also were, you know, not necessarily the, the um, well, now we've had a lot of renovations and a lot of our schools are getting to a lot better place. But it, there, there were, there's a lens that we can look at how um, we are serving our students and um, also, you know, um, engage our um, our staff in in um, embodying that through their teaching, through their work, and in other ways. I think there's a lot of um, great things happening, but I'm passionate about seeing that through. Yeah, um, I think that all of all of the above, definitely. I mean, we we have some really big. Um, things we're working on. One of them is actually the boundary study. And I also want to kind of give a shout out to the community that all of our school board meetings, um, you can watch them live and then you can watch the recording after. Um, we had a particularly epic one the other night where we covered lots and lots of territory and lots of things. And, and um, they're great to watch. I mean, really to get a sense of the things that are going on, what we think, those are a, a great, a great, uh, opportunity to, to see what's what we're doing. Um, fair funding obviously is huge. We are not funded correctly. Um, but I want to just say um, something that I've said before that I really like that I don't think it's talked about enough is student voice. That's something I'm really passionate about. And, and when I say student voice, I don't mean just high schoolers. I mean, little kids all the way up. I think that traditional school systems don't do a good job of talking to kids, empowering kids, seeing what kids um, think about things, you know, they are small humans. <laughs> Let's talk to them. And actually it kind of struck me, I'm really, really proud of it. Um, uh, the homecoming, I don't know if you follow McCaskey at all on Instagram, but they have the homecoming court and um, each candidate said, you know, why? what's great about McCaskey? And a number of them said, I like, uh, I really like McCaskey because I feel like, like the students um, speak up and are, you know, can be heard and and I was encouraged by that, but we um, we have a ways to go, you know. I mean, we're just now uh, getting a student council together, but but on every single level, we need to ask kids what they think. That is so important. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have another question from Joseph Romanoff. Um, this is a little bit more serious. Um, I know personally over the last couple of days, I've heard of a couple of different instances of bullying, um, specifically at the middle schools. Um, so this question from Joseph states, um, what do you plan, what would the, uh, candidates plan to do, um, as a support for those who are being heavily bullied? Um, says a lot of children are now in school in person while the pandemic is real. Um, kids are bullied in school and those sometimes turn into tragic incidents um, and mental health is used as a scapegoat um, when we know that it's, they've been driven to a mental health, those children have been driven to a mental health incident, not necessarily um, had a history of mental health issues. So um, again, the question would be, what would the candidates plan to do as a support for those children, students who are being heavily bullied? Yeah, uh, that's where I would say that social emotional um, learning comes into play um, because you know it provides a support for those students who are going through the bullying but it also can target the kids who are doing the bullying and find out why they're doing that bullying. You know, is it something that they're just projecting from home, uh, you know, or a learned behavior and try to address that, in, you know, in a way that it's, you know, a learning tool for them and, you know, and try to get that th through that, you know, for those kids. At the same time, you know, it help address that at home. You know, maybe you know, mom and dad don't know, you know, that that's what they're doing. You know, you know, give those parents the support them at home to address 
address that. And then the same thing for the kid, parents or the kids who are getting bullied. A lot of times they're not going to tell mom and dad um, that they're getting bullied just because, you know, they're afraid of, you know, what's going to happen or, you know, they just don't want to cause any more trouble. And we'll give those parents resources to, you know, help deal with that at home, um, you know, in a caring fashion. Thanks Go ahead, Jen. Um, this is uh, this is really relevant because I was I was just talking with a friend yesterday who had concerns about an incident that happened in front of McCaskey yesterday and what should she do? And um, it was a moment that I felt like I needed to draw on um, a lot of uh, like yes, what do we do next? Uh, from from the uh, SAP protocols that I learned before to you know what 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 how do we encourage families to advocate? Um, typically starting with your classroom teacher, moving to your principal, um, and there are steps in between sometimes. Um, I really um, would take some time, especially after you know having that conversation yesterday to learn what we are doing, um, what programs are in place. I know at one point in time, um, we were an all days um, bullying prevention um, partner. I don't know if that's something that the school district is still doing, um, but there are tools. Um, I also was encouraged to see, at least on McCaskey's website, um, or maybe it was in their handbook, that there is an organization that is being partnered with um, McCaskey for people to be able to, to call and make um, um, complaints anonymously if they're not feeling safe. And that from what I was able to read is uh, will help them to to put them in touch with people who then can follow um, hopefully at an administrative level as well. I don't know if that's something that's happening across the district. If it's not, I'd love to uh, to see. I think that that's something that would be beneficial in the middle schools and possibly even in the elementary schools because it's certainly um, something that I think that is an unfortunate side effect of a lot of kids trying to figure out how to deal with big emotions that they don't necessarily have the, the language or the tools for. And also we need to learn how to, to help them through that. Um, there are wraparound services in the school through our student family resource officers. And also um, most, if I remember correctly, should have a relationship with a, a, an on-site counselor, a psychologist that, that has times. And so I hopefully if a, if a family member or if, a, if an individual is advocating for their student, you know, and they're going up the chain, they also um, will feel comfortable to say, hey, can we also look for what are um, the things that we can um, tie into for the student so that they're getting their emotional needs taken care of. They have lots of safe adults who are paying attention. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, perhaps, you know, do some things that can help those students come to a better place. Um, if not, then there needs to be further conversations um, and action as well. Um, so I'm gonna do a lot of listening. I'd like to learn more. Yeah, I. Um, that's all really good, Jen. Um, we, we do, have, um, like Jen referenced, um, school and family resource specialists in every school, in addition to our guidance counselors. Um, we have um, invested probably more than many districts around in uh, these positions. Um, and we have a number of programs that we use. All that being said, you know, you can have all the grown ups and all the programs you want, but uh, families and kids need to know how to access those programs and people and that's a communication issue and we have to make sure um, that we're making it really clear to kids and adults this is how if you need help um, this is how it goes and adults you need to be paying very close attention and constantly communicating um, with kids um, I will say I you know being a parent I have heard from my from my child that yeah it's been that reentry has been tough after the pandemic. And she actually made the point to me. She said, mom, I said, she said, these, these freshmen seem like they're having a hard time. She said, you know, a lot of them have not been in school since they were in seventh grade. And that kind of hit home to me because we do, we basically have, you know, um, kids who were last middle schoolers and middle school is tough. We all know that, um, who are now at the high school. And I think the adjustment is tough for kids. I think it's a tough for our staff who has been working, 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 throughout this. I think that we have to be very uh, cognizant of 
what everybody's been through and constantly looking for ways to give each other grace and also be helpful and kind to each other. But um, yeah, do know that we have programs. We can always do better, but we just need to make sure that we know how ev that everybody knows how to access things. This, uh, this issue seems to be red hot everywhere right now with uh, Facebook and uh, being called into account. And the meeting the other night, uh, Tuesday, looks like the, the, the whole uh, program will be addressed again. And it sounds like there's been a number of, um, let's say, safeguards or um, resources put in place. I agree with, with uh, Mara that if you don't know where they are, you don't know how to use them and you might be too shy to do it or too afraid. Um, um, I don't know how many of you are uh, uh, familiar with restorative justice and which I think is a very good attitude and program uh, and a philosophy uh, to address this sort of thing. So yes, it is, it is there and um, it, we're all back at school after a year and a half. So it's a readjustment. So. Thank you, thank you for that. And, and you know, I think the idea, what you said about restorative justice, it touches on what one of our, um, one of our viewers had mentioned, which was um, Belisa had just said, you know, what, what happens with for the victim so that they feel like they can be heard. And while there are lots of different ways that that can occur and happen and school districts do a lot of different things to, to you know, sometimes they address that and sometimes they don't, um, you know, the idea of that sort of justice is, is one pretty powerful way when done correctly that the victim's voice can be heard. Um, as long as all parties are willing to be there and listen. So, you know, and that's, I think that's part of the catch with, with restorative justice, but it is, it is certainly the, um, I think right now that's the thing to strive for, absolutely to help with that. Um, and just very quick, I see you Mara, uh, uh, just very quickly. Um, I also just wanted to say, uh, just to, to catch up, Joseph had had a question that LaRock had, had um, asked about the bullying, but he was also just concerned or thinking more specifically about bullying because of homophobia, um, bullying because of racism, and, you know, how that would be addressed, I guess, specifically with students. But I think the even bigger question um, from him is, you know, there are teachers also that have these... Um, you know, unhealthy attitudes towards their students and act out or do things that uh, their classrooms are not a safe space. And, um, you, know, whether that's be, you know, whether that's because of racist things they do in their classroom or homophobic things they do in their classroom, et cetera. So he was also wondering like what kind of um, trainings, like if there will be, if there'll be trainings for teachers or like professional development, like what your ideas or thoughts are on having that kind of an inclusion workshop, you know, cultural competency, et cetera. Um, did you want to go ahead, Mary? Yeah, um, just really fast to your last point about restorative justice. That actually is um, the primary focus, at least in the high school, um, when we are in conflict situations with students. Just so you know that, yeah, that is definitely the focus. Um, the equity work we've been working on for Lewis three years. Is that about right? I think. Um, about right. Yeah, that is that that is the way that um, we are um, really starting to work as a district. And that's every person in the district. That's not just teachers. That's not that that's us. We, in fact, the other day did a workshop on uh, on um, basically on that topic as a board, you know, like just a, a, a retreat. Um, so we, you know, it's a work in progress. I'm not going to pretend that everything is great and everybody, you know, understands everything. Um, but, but it's our primary focus. And it's kind of what Jen said before. It's what Dr. Rao says often is that everything needs to be through an equity lens. Um, I, you know, my personal opinion is that, yeah, when we, we hire people, they need, it needs to be very clear what our, our philosophical, um, and equity uh, 
work is in this district. And if you know, you, you know this when you're applying, this, this needs to be made very clear to people. Um, I will say there is a difference. I think sometimes people think that we are the people who do the administrative work in the district and we're actually a policy board. Um, so we, we uh, develop policy and then the administration um, for, I, I don't wanna say enforces, but that is really the way it is, you know, develops how that looks within our district. Um, so, so it's always a really fine line. It's a gray area. What, you know, we can get in the weeds a little bit and, you know, micromanage and that sort of thing. So, um, so we, that's, that's something that we're always working on trying to figure out. Um, we did just actually, I don't know if anybody, and I'd love to put it in, um, in the group, um, we're the only district in the county that just passed um, a, uh, a statement in support of um, LGBTQ plus um, students, staff, families. Um, and that was spearheaded by our um, board member, Karina Rios. And she did a pretty amazing job with that, uh, moving that through. And we were, it was unanimous. We, you know, we affirmed, we affirmed that. Um, so I think that, unfortunately, we didn't get any publicity for it. I think that's an important thing. But yeah, if you come to work in SDOL, you need to, to recognize that these are things that are important. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Um, oh, go ahead, Lewis. I was going to say, I just want to add to what Mara was saying. You know, oh, the district already does professional development when it comes to inclusion um, and all those things. Um, and, and you know the the policy that we said we just kind of just we kind of give the district parameters or guidelines and they they're the ones that put it into action and, and act, you know actual nut and bolt plan that's solid we just kind of give them the framework of what you know the vision that we want for, for the district so it is it is a little tough to sit there and you know we don't get to choose we don't get to set the actual administrative procedure but we just set the policy which they developed the procedure from thank you for that um lewis um Lorac, i don't know if you want to check in the chat there was um a question from bianca and it, i think it connects to what we were just talking about if you would like to read that out loud um, I can definitely read it out loud. Um, I think between our two incumbents, they pretty much covered uh, the basis of it. Um, but that question would be, could you explain the roles? Could you explain the role of school board members in these decisions um, and policies? Because it seemed as though some of the questions um, kind of tipped more towards administrative roles than um, procedural policy um, making roles um, I will, yeah, I, dave perry who's not here um he's four-year incumbent he actually pushed push pushed to make us much better about policy um we actually have a policy committee um it's a really really great way of, of looking at policy and all of our policies we're working on um, putting a statement uh, a, a belief statement at the beginning of each of them which is something we never had before which says this is why we think this is important so um, obviously not every policy we have is there because there are so many that we haven't been through all of them but um, if you're ever ever wanting to go on our uh, website and take a look at our policies that's really really important and that's really our probably our most important job we supervise the superintendent we hire hire and supervise the superintendent we um, set policy and we approve a budget we uh, you know mm -hmm. um, figure out a way to pay for all of it so in a really high 30,000 foot level this is what school directors do yeah, the, yeah, that exactly right. The, the role that I see for the directors is to set policy, approve the budget, and be responsible for hiring the appropriate people, i.e. the uh, superintendent, to enact these things. And that is why these positions are elected positions for the board. And I'd also like to point out to people that School board members are to be nonpartisan. It is, is now we are running as Democrats, but you can pro cross file because it is to be nonpartisan because the focus is to be the children, the students, and the community, not 
your personal political agenda. And so um, you said policy, you pay the bills and uh, hire the superintendent. Thank you. Thanks you, for that. Did anyone you, else? You don't just, you, yeah, you're not setting the lunch menu. <laughs> right. I, yes. I, and I think that's really clear because I think people do misunderstand sometimes the role of, of the school board and what their, you know, what their power is and how far they reach um, and do confuse that administrative level with the, with the higher um, school board level. Yes, Mara. I don't, I don't want to hog, hog this, but a really, um, really cool thing that happened was I was in an elementary school. These guys have heard this, but um, I was in an elementary school. I was reading with a kindergartner, which is a wonderful thing. We don't do that very often. Um, it was when they had just come back last year and it, I looked at him and I thought, well, everything that is going on right now is something that I got to help with as a school board member. He was reading on his iPad which was something that we approved and made sure that every kid had one. He was back in school, which was, you know, something that we voted on bringing them back. And the reading program he was using, um, ARC reading was something that we also, you know, spent a lot of time looking at talking about. And all three of those things together in this little person, this little kindergartner, those were all board decisions. And it was really just kind of uh, an aha moment of, so this is what we do and this is what it looks like in practice in the classroom. Thank you. Yes, thank you again, again for that. Um, so I know we do have another question from our um, our viewers, and I'm so happy you guys are filling the chat box. I'm trying to scroll through and like look like I'm paying attention, but I appreciate it. Keep them coming. Um, so we have a question from Sean Hogan. And he asks, what can the board do to help district leadership improve how it models and supports its own restorative justice programs or equity programs as an organization? Um, the ideas of those initiatives are solid, but unless practiced with authenticity at the higher levels, they wouldn't really work. So I guess um, he's sort of asking, how are you checking in to make sure that these policies that are being set forth are being um, done uh, fulfilled with uh, integrity and 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 with fidelity to it. So um, I'm not sure. I know can, that we can have. I, can I jump? Can I jump in here real quick, Joanna? Because it seems sure. like we're getting a bunch of questions along the same guidelines. And so um, Jen kind of spoke to a plan earlier. So how about if we could? Could we just kind of lay out some? If there is a plan, could we just kind of lay out what that looks like? If some loose framework um, to kind of get everybody on the same page as far as what is uh, what what's being taught, what's being worked through um, with the students and the faculty as well. I've got to leave that to you guys. Sorry. Is there, is there a, um, I don't know this part, um, for the members, uh, Lewis and, and Mara, is there a report quarterly or monthly back to the board as to uh, somebody, that, uh, somebody that is coordinating, there, there were, six acts of bullying at Reynolds School. There were 14 incidents of this or that. Is there anything like that that comes back to the board? Look, yeah. I, I don't think we get a, like a very specific breakdown. Um, I don't think that comes across to us. Um, I don't know if Mara can correct me, but I don't think we get a breakdown. Yeah. You don't and get a specific safety. breakdown like that. Yeah, safety, safety report, we get an annual report. So, okay. I mean, I think if, if we're getting to the larger issues of what our equity program is, is that, Laroc, is that kind of your, your question? Like what that looks like? Correct. What, um, yeah. It, it's yeah. seeming the last three or four questions have been stemming around, um, you know, what, how equity is being how people within the school district are being informed and taught about equity and um, what 
those teachings or what those informative sessions look like? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as far as um, what that looks like in a building, every building has a person. Um, we're using kind of a train the trainer model. Uh, we have a company and oh, Lewis, help me out here. What is the name of the agency or the firm we're working with? Um, anyway, so uh, and I'm, I'm going remember. to, what is it? I don't remember at the top okay. of my head either. <laughs> I, what I'm, I'm trying to look around and see if I can find it and put something, you know, into chat so that you can see it all laid out. Uh, but yeah, it's a train the trainer model so that every, there is a person in every building um, that is, you know, the go-to person in that building. I will say this is a work in progress and we still have a very active equity committee in the district. Um, the idea, there's, I think, two big initiatives right now with that. Um, one is we don't have an equity policy in our policy manual, but that is the end goal of this committee is that there will be an equity policy. I'm not, I don't sit on that committee, um, a couple other board members do, um, and that will be brought to us to approve. Um, the other initiative that um, Dr. Rao presented to us last week, um, she is proposing that we have a director of equity for the, the entire district. And that would be an administrative position that would be a, you know, a cabinet level position. Um, you know, it's not defined completely yet, but it's um, a person who is at that level who directs um, all those initiatives and many other things. And I think it, it, it's kind of an exciting proposition because I think it could be things that we haven't thought of yet. Um, so, you know, in the next couple of months, that'll be fleshed out a little bit more to us. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't speak to the specifics, but I am like also talking to you and trying to find it online that I can put out to everybody. If I can jump in, um, and, and this is a kind of a, a personal opinion, um, as opposed to a what can you do situation, but I know that one of the conversations we have at the district PAC level is that sometimes it, um, the, from whatever programs come down from the student services or um, um, instruction and learning, um, they're given to the sites and the sites implement. Um, and, and, and as far as I know, for the most part with fidelity, but will students, a student say that um, moves in the middle of the year from Wharton um, move seamlessly to Washington or to another school where will their advancement be different? Are they are their learning goals the same? And because so many things can be done within the site level um, and they're get empowered to do what their community needs, it often looks very, very different across the district. Not necessarily a bad thing because all of our schools need different things and we need equity, not necessarily equality per se, but through that lens, we, we do need to have someone paying attention to what that looks like. And are we implementing with fidelity? Is it happening across districts, whether it's a bullying program or the ARC program or the math curriculum, that it's being taught to the students in such a way that they could go through this district and be seamless and not miss a beat, not fall through a crack. And that's super important. Um, it's And that's something that's kind of a, um, a devil in the details, but it's really important to pay attention to. Um, so that's something that I think I would like to hear more of, and, and maybe that also occurs um, already, but I'd like to hear, you know, how, how are different schools doing things and what are the best practices and how are they sharing them also? I, I, I want to say like for part of that, I think that's what that director of equity um, is going to be doing is going to look at, at the programs at the district level um, and ensure that we're all the programs that are being run through the district and then filter down are through that equity lens. They just haven't fleshed out. They only presented to that us last week. They haven't fleshed out exactly what they're doing it, but because um, a lot of that equity work is being done at that at the committee level. Um, but it's it's getting so big their work they're they're overloaded and they're all volunteers are at that committee and there's many different people on that committee that they've now seen the need to have a specific person within the district to handle that and you know and get get that work started and 
a more, I guess, fidelity or, you know, in earnest um, with the district. Um, thank you all for that. Um, I think it was very uh, thoughtful. Um, I would like, definitely like to delve into um, that link when I have the time. Um, right now it's probably not optimal. Um, but um, Melissa has another question. Um, she says during the during the board meeting, I'm not sure which one, but during the board meeting, they mentioned monitoring via video for the threat of, for the threat assessment plan. Will having cameras on buses be considered? And I'm guessing that would be more for an incumbent than a can than a new candidate. Yeah, I um I don't know the answer to that. Um, I will say our we do contract out, so our buses are not owned by us, and the the drivers we uh we work with Schultz. Um, that being said, obviously you know they work for us, so um, that I don't know the answer to that. But that would be um, a question that you know we could certainly find the answer to. Um, a, a, our um, you know, the administrators who, who work with that could, could answer that. And, and I know that we also talked about, you know, last week we're, or on Tuesday, not last week, on Tuesday, we're talking about the boundary study, um, how that's going to change and that may be affecting transportation um, that's gonna be coming up, whether it be partnering up with uh, the Red Rose Transit, which, you know, they do have cameras in their buses, but, you know, that's something that's, until that boundary study gets done and we figure out what our transportation plan is going to look like, it's going to be really difficult to even be able to get an answer on just that question now as it is until we get that boundary study done. The um, cameras on the buses and, and um, the I was at the meeting the other night and the school threat assessment was brought up. And um, this is, I believe, an area that has to be entered into very carefully. Um, we, we have a lot of civil liberties issues here and parental um, involvement and so I, I think we want to be very careful with this. Thanks, that's Molly. All, Go ahead. That's Jen. all I want to say about that. I just want to jump in. And Molly, I'm not sure if you're talking about jumping in, which you're talking about jumping in too lightly. The threat no, assessment no, process. Not, to, not suggest that, no. Do you mean the, the buses and the camera or the threat assessment piece? Um, both, both, I would say. Because the only thing that I would add is, as um, I was watching it, I, it was occurring to me that this threat assessment process is very, very similar to a process that's already been in place for over 10 years. And it's kind of just getting a different name. And, and that's the SAP process, um, student mm. uh, action, that's not action, student, the panel of professionals, leaders in the school, the teacher, the counselors, the, mm -hmm. the community school director, if it's available, and people who can, who can look at these, you know, threats, these assessment referrals by teachers or in different situations, perhaps a, a parent has even made a request and, and, and kind of do some of that private internal legwork to see what's already happening. And that requires training. I had to go through several days of training over at the um, county emergency facility. Anyways, that was that was a while ago. But I mean, so I, I'm not, I, I think that we also have um, some some processes that are already in place and maybe they need to be revisited and perhaps that's why they're renaming it. But I mean, as far as treading lightly, that's why I wanted to, to clarify what you were saying. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that, that particular policy, um, there's a, there are a fair number of policies that come to us from the state be, um, that have to be changed from the state. And that was one of those that is state driven. 
Um, and like Jen said, we do have a lot of those, those uh, groups um, in place, but if you watch the presentation by our safety and security um, person, um, he was saying that, yes, we have a lot of this, we're kind of formalizing, cleaning up, really naming who are on those committees. So that would be an example of one that we don't have tons of say over, but it's also highlights the fact that we have a really strong policy committee and we spend a lot of time talking about these and then bring them to the board and we talk about them again. So policy is not exciting, but oh my gosh, so important. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But yeah, thank you for that, Mara. And, and I'll be honest, you guys, I mean, just sitting here and listening to these conversations, you know, it gives people just a little bit of a taste of, of what it really means to be sitting on a school board and the things that you have to deliberate and the things that you need to mull over and, and you know, suss through and, and piece through to try to find um, the, the best solution to serve our students in our district. Because in the end, that is exactly what the school board's ultimate job is, is to best serve um, our students. I am just so pleased that you were all able to make it. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll put a little pin for, for David at some point um, <laughs> to hopefully maybe get him back in and, and hear some from him. But I just appreciate all of the time and the effort um, that you have put in to being at the meetings, but even just campaigning. I know that that has to, had to have been an exhausting, um, an exhausting experience as well. And so I just wish all of you the best of luck, and um, maybe I'll maybe I'll sit in on one of the school board meetings one day. You might maybe you'll see my purple hair again someday. Maybe we'll do that. But thank you so so much, and um, yeah. So I think that's uh, thank you to all of the participants. Thank you to the viewers who came to sit in and um, and listen to our uh, our meeting. Thank you so much for the questions you asked. There were some really deep and good questions there. Um, so I will say good night on behalf of LaRock and myself uh, and NAACP. Blessings to you all and have a very good evening. <laughs>